Hello, welcome to this session of Upstreaming for Qualcomm SOC based port. My name is Vinod Kaul. Uh, I've been doing embedded Linux kernel work since 2007. Uh, previously, I used to work for Intel in the audio team for their phone for it. Uh, I, from, in the kernel, I am also the maintainer of uh, kernel DMA engine uh, soundware subsystems. I also do ALSA compressed audio. Uh, along with this, uh, I'm co maintaining generic file subsystem. Uh, nowadays, I'm working for Linaro and in the Linaro uh, Qualcomm landing team. So the Qualcomm landing team is a specific uh, team inside Linaro uh, where our job is to upstream for Qualcomm uh, chipsets. Uh, we try to solve problems in upstream for Qualcomm chipsets and uh, upstream of, uh, upstreaming of various drivers. Now, when we talk about upstreaming and Qualcomm, these two terms uh, we typically do not use in the same sentence. And if we do, it's typically in a negative fashion. So uh, when I joined Qualcomm, uh, sorry, when I joined Linaro uh, a couple of years back, uh, I, I'm trying to learn about device tree, Qualcomm chipset and ARM architecture. So during the course of uh, my work, I have picked a few things and then uh, I was given the task of upstreaming the base port for uh, premier tire chipset and uh, this talk essentially uh, documents the journey which i undertook while trying to upstream uh, the base port support for a qualcomm chipset so in that sense uh, when we go through this journey we would uh, learn about how easy or difficult it is to upstream for qualcomm ch uh, chipset and uh, this uh, documentation probably may help other people uh, in when they try to do similar upstreaming for the qualcomm chipsets they might have so with this let's get started so first we'll cover how do we go about uh, baseport upstreaming uh, then how it easy or difficult it is to get the serial console access and what are the steps we need to take so once we have serial console access we can actually start to look into other subsystems and uh, uh, start enabling them uh, so first we'll work on the pin control and clocks then once we have that uh, rest of the devices would also need regulators so we'll work on that and for a decent device we need a storage so we'll discuss ufs briefly and then in the end we'll discuss about the usb in this talk we will not be talking about modem or multimedia and these things uh typically these are big enough topics which would warrant their own talk so we'll kind of not deal with these uh, specific agenda uh, items so with this let's get started how does one work on a qualcomm chipset uh Qualcomm is a member of Cordero Forum, and the Cordero Forum is basically a Linux Foundation project where they collab. Uh, Qualcomm is one of the leading, uh, uh, one of the leading uh, members of that particular project. So what Qualcomm does is it opens up all of its source code for the kernel uh, in the. CAF website, which is listed here. Uh, for a particular SOC, you would find a specific uh, kernel version, um, which is available on Cordero Forum. So when I started this work at that time, MSM 4.14 was actually the latest uh, version available. Uh, this is typically derived from the last LTS. They take the LTS and start enabling their uh, tire, premium tire chipsets on that. and. Uh, this is what they released to their vendors and partners. So MSM 4.14 was the last released last year and this year, uh, earlier in the April, they have already released MSM 4.19. So we uh, in future, hopefully we'll have future revisions of this uh, kernel. Uh, so once we have the kernel downstream source, we can look at the various, uh, how the dri various drivers are written, how, what modifications have been done. Some of them are based on upstream drivers. Some of them are completely not using upstream drivers, uh, just use the downstream versions available. And then if you have a uh, board schematics available, that will tell you how that various devices peripherals are connected. That's typically important when you try to check what clocks are required for a device, wh how regulators are connected and so forth. And of course you need the board. So once you have all these uh, material available, we'll try to enable the serial console. So as I was saying, uh, uh, I was given this task of enabling the support for the premium tire chipset, and that happened to be SM8150. Uh, this was uh, 
released in July 2009. Uh, last year, it was one of the leading mobile SSCs around. Um, Pixel 4 and the Poco F1 and other premier phones which were released last year feature this chipset. So a brief uh, look at the diagram of this chipset. Uh, the, ch the chipset has SM8150 SOC. Uh, it features from the uh, uh, from the display point of view DSI ports. Uh, it also has SPI and I2C ports for sensor for, uh, and then it has CSI ports for camera. Uh, it connect, it has, it has support for both high speed and super speed USB. Uh, it supports UFS at STIO. Uh, then it connects to PMIX PM8009, 8150B and L variants as well. Uh, then we have WCN chip and QCA chip for connectivity. It also supports slim bus and soundware and PDM dimming for audio. How do we go about boot to console? So the serial driver is upstream, so there's no changes required for the serial driver. Uh, in this case, if you look at the serial driver, which is Qualcomm Gen I, uh, we, it uh, gives us two compatibles. One is Qualcomm Gen I Debug UART and one is Qualcomm Gen I UART. The UART is used for uh, various UART functionality. For serial console, we need to use the Qualcomm Gen I Debug UART. Uh, along with the UART, you will need a simple reduced clock driver, basically which describes only the UART clocks and nothing else. Uh, with this, you should be able to boot to console. These are the only two things you will need uh, for console to be enabled. Uh, yes, of course, you need the basic DT description. We will talk about that basic DT description up next. So when you have described uh, the basic clock driver and uh, are ready with your Genai driver for the class C uh, serial console, you would need to describe the particular SOC in uh, a very simple steps, basically SOC, timer, and so forth. So let's see how do we uh, do that. So what we do is we take the downstream uh, device tree description. Uh, it has a bunch of additional fields which may or may not be relevant when we try to upstream things. So first we go and describe the CPUs and in the downstream DTS you can find for SM8150 it has a cryo 484, 485 cores. Uh, with these frequencies, one gold at 3.6 gigahertz, three gold at 2.7 gigahertz, and four gold at 2.3 gigahertz. So we go about adding the new compatible for this CPU and add the uh, eight CPUs found in the device tree. Uh, then uh, GCC, we already, GCC is basically global uh, clock controller, not to be confused with our new C compiler. So we go and add the GCC driver and the compatible, we already have the reduced driver written for UART. So that should work. Uh, then the, uh, we also need to describe the timer. Uh, timer driver is upstream, so we don't need to worry about that. It's just that we need to look at the uh, address in the downstream device tree, use that, and add the compatible ARM v7 timer mem. Uh, serial we have already described, so we add that description in the device tree and try to boot. Uh, these were the basic steps which I required to boot SM8150 on. Uh, 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 platform on the upstream uh, but I didn't need any additional changes next uh, so with this we have the serial control console uh, done next we go about the pin control so downstream driver already has a pin control driver so we take that and start to clean it up uh, one of the things which Bjorn Anderson who also works in the Naro landing the Qualcomm landing team uh, has done is add uh, support for disjoint tiles uh, what I found that uh, Qualcomm SOC have bunch of uh, tiles which provide the pin control functionality as it uh, in total so we need to describe not just one controller instance but bunch of tiles for the whole pin controller so uh, uh, in order to support these uh, tiles in traditionally they were joint so it was kind of a one big description but then in some of the platforms they turned out to be disjoint so beyond added the support to have disjoint tiles so in this case the tip is that we even use uh, 
uh, tiles for joint tiles uh, uh, tile support for joint tiles because uh, it gives us uh, free handling of XPU and as they, we don't map them we just map the specific tile areas uh, in the case of SM8150 we found that we had four tiles and uh, we add the, all the four tile descriptions then we go, uh, go about adding the UFS reset uh, after the, the pin control pins and SD pins at the last. Uh, this is typically a requirement from the UFS pins where it looks up at the, uh, on the pin control and uh, last pin it expects to be the UFS and SD. So that's kind of hard coded in the driver for various chipsets. Then we have already described the reduced clock driver for the serial clocks, but uh, in order to get other uh, devices up and running, we need the complete clock driver. Uh, downstream already has a would already have a clock driver available, so we take that. Uh, but unfortunately, downstream clock driver uh, would be described in an older language, and in upstream, uh, Steve Wired has already migrated the clock drivers to use. Uh, parent data scheme uh, so this is one of the new things which happened while i was doing the implementation for asm 8150 so the parent data scheme is basically describing the parents of a clock uh, in uh, not as arrays of uh, arrays but then a direct reference to the clocks uh, uh, this helps resolve namespace issues apparently in clocks because you can have multiple clock controllers and uh, everybody referring to the same uh, names might cause collisions so instead of that we kind of use the direct references uh, on a platform you will typically have external clocks like crystal oscillator sleep clock and in case of clock or Qualcomm, we have something called as rpmcc we'll talk about that in a later so we describe these as parents in the device tree and uh, refer to these clocks uh, this is one of the new steps you would have to do in the recent kernels if you were in the older kernels you will not need to do this uh, but we are upstream now so we need to work on this uh, then to port the driver uh, as described we need to do the parent data screen then we describe the parents of that particular platform in the device tree uh, in the downstream driver there are a bunch of fields which are added uh, for their own uh, handling in downstream kernels we don't have equivalent handling of those in upstream so we kind of start to remove those bits one of the things in the clock driver is vdd fields so we remove that uh, then for uh, clock ops uh, we use uh, uh, different ops as compared to downstream so uh, i created a simple lookup for the clock ops so in case of clock uh, branch to hardware control ops we have to use clock branch simple ops and in case of clock gate to ops we have to use clock uh, branch to ops uh, so with this your clock driver will be ported and you can start enabling the clock driver and boot with the clock driver one of the debug tips in case of clocks is to look up at the debug fs debug fs is a very wonderful thing while enabling uh, devices it has lots of information for you to find out what is going around in the system and what is going wrong so in this case um, uh, you have for the clock we have sys kernel debug clock and then there's a file called summary so a clock summary basically tells you how many clocks are there on that particular platform which is what are the parents of the specific clocks how many childs of the clock are there what is the frequency they are running on and how many uh, times the clock has been enabled or is it not enabled at all so this gives you a good view for example if you are expecting a clock to be used uh, by a particular device and that device is enabled but that clock is not used or the rate is wrong so it will help you to find out what's going on in the system so when you look up at the clock summary in that particular uh, uh, Qualcomm chipset you might be surprised that some clocks actually do not have parents but if you look at the description of downstream clock driver you would also realize that so the reason for this is that these are shared clocks and uh, Linux doesn't manage the parents so we just describe these clocks for the use in the uh, various devices excuse me So with this, um, uh, you will have the clock driver done. 
and uh, uh, one of the things in the clock driver as i said is to look up at the debug fs to see if the mm -hmm. things are done right or not and keep on doing it iteratively uh, we were talking uh, previously about uh, describing various clocks so a uh, little bit more information on that because i feel this is kind of not documented anywhere and kind of a tribal knowledge amongst the people so on uh, qualcomm chipsets crystal oscillator is present which generates clock typically at 19.2 megahertz or 38.4 megahertz and then it actually feeds that clock to the pmic in this instance it was a pmic pm8150 so that pmic in turn feeds the 19.2 uh, megahertz clock to the soc as a cxo in so the pmic is the entity which uh, takes the crystal uh, clock and then generates 19.2 as well as bunch of other clocks so we call this as rpmh cxo clock and that is the xo for the soc uh, and the co controller which is which is resides inside the pmic uh, to configure and control these clocks is called as rpmh cc so this is something uh, which is specific to qualcomm uh, other platforms or other chip uh, soc vendors may or may not have this kind of architecture so you need to figure that out uh, so this rpm clock controller is uh, uh, not uh, directly managed by linux we kind of send the messages to our remote proc framework to the clock controller and uh, uh, ask it to configure the various clocks and so forth so uh, in order to describe this uh, so step back one step back here sorry uh, so the, in order to describe all these uh, clocks uh, we look first we will first look at the device tree description of how the how we describe the xo and uh, rpm clocks and the c uh, input feeding the input to the soc and then we will go into details about the uh, rpm clock controller so since we have two fixed clocks we describe these as a fixed clock uh, in the description of the board uh, DDS. This is not a SOC DTS, this is a board DTS. So we describe XO board as a whatever clock frequency and then give the uh, provided the output name. In this case, we did XO board. There was additional sleep clock present, which is typically you will find in a bunch of platforms as 32 kilohertz clock. Uh, that sleep clock is provided here as well. Uh, then in the previous diagram here, we saw that the crystal clock is actually feeding to PMIC. So that let's describe the uh, PMIC RPM clock. So RPM clock controller is described here and we add a new compatible for that. We'll go into a little bit details of that in a little while. And then we uh, specify that the clock feeding to this is the exoboard clock so this is the one which is important and it describes the parent clocks this is the work of steve boyer in upstream in describing uh, the parent clocks directly then uh, we go to the global clock controller and we describe that clock controller and we tell it that the parent clock is rpm clock controller and this is the clock and it also takes sleep clock so that's the second clock we feed to it uh, so this essentially tells in these two device tree description that we have a crystal clock and crystal clock is feeding to the RPM clock and then RPM clock uh, CXO pin is feeding to the SOC as a DCXO input. So this was the parent, uh, parent uh, uh, description in the uh, clock drivers. So with this, if you see there's a direct reference to clock, so you might have a, another clock named XO on the board, but will not have a namespace collision because we will be referring directly to this XO board clock here. Now, the uh, discussing the RPMH clock controller, which is the missing piece here. So, as I was saying, the PMIC clocks are actually managed by RPM. RPM stands for Remote Processor Management, and uh, this uh, driver is already upstream, so you don't need to do any much of it. Uh, which uh, we need to take this uh, look at the driver clock, clock Alcom clock RPMH.c. Uh, uh, as you seen in the previous device tree description, we will add a new compatible and describe the clocks because. Uh, 
uh, what we're seeing here is that different uh, platforms may have different clock outputs from the PME coming in. So these are described in RPMH uh, with the different offsets. So this description, it's basically a table of description which needs to be added for the platform. So basically a platform specific adaptation of the driver. So with this, uh, we don't need to write the driver but just describe the compatible and the uh, data. So with this, the clock uh, drivers are done. We switch to the different infrastructure used by the rest of the drivers. So first is a command DB. This is actually used by the clock controller. So basically command DB is a command database as the name might imply. It's a shared memory SOC driver. Uh, so it essentially helps finding the SOC specific identifier and information. So as we discussed previously, there are RPM clocks and RPM needs to communicate to the PMIC uh, about the specific uh, clock which needs to be enabled. So how does it go about identifying which is the information? So uh, there comes this memory, uh, there comes this uh, uh, command DB database which is populated by the uh, firmware on the board and uh, you can look up and find out okay for this particular clock this is the particular identifier I need to use it to communicate to the uh, uh, RPA PMIC and that's what we use so this is one of the required prerequisites in order for us to enable the uh, uh, RPM clock controller and you can in the downstream tree you can find this information about the command db from the memory map so we add it in the device tree and it should work the next is regulators uh, unfortunately uh, this is one of the topics still where downstream is not uh, reused in uh, too much uh, hopefully things will improve in future uh, uh, RPM in this case the again uh, as we discussed like the clock controller RPMH also controls the regulators so we have a regulator driver for that which is Qualcomm RPMH regulator driver you can find it in the drivers regulator Qualcomm RPMH regulator dot C uh, in the downstream description uh, you can see the PMIC ID uh, we use it to get the address from the command DB as we did for the clocks so we describe uh, so uh, even if we are not doing something on the uh, Qualcomm, if we are describing uh, regulators, how would one go about it? Let's take a step back and think about that. So what we would go is we would take the schematics and um, look at the schematics and say uh, how different devices are connected to the regulators and uh, how I would go about this is to look at the PMIX supplies uh, to start with, uh, how many PMIX are present, how, how, what are the supplies they do provide, then if, are there any SMPSs or LDOs present uh, in the board and how they are connected to the supplies and then how the LDOs are feeding to the respective devices. So basically, yeah, I would create a map of the PMIX um, regulator supplies all the way from PMIX all to the devices and that is essentially the description we would provide in the board device tree. Uh, key value here is that it should be a board device tree, not your SOC device tree, because uh, the way the regulators are connected to the device is typically, in my opinion, dependent on the board. Different boards may connect it differently, and uh, some boards may connect it uh, straight away. So uh, the description should actually be coded in the specific. Uh, board DTS file. So we go and describe the PMIX supplies and the SMPSs and the LDOs that are fed and then describe the uh, supply, uh, LD, uh, describe the supplies and then the uh, particular device uh, DTS will describe the that I'm using uh, so and so regulators and this is how the whole connectivity will be established. Uh, now, uh, once we are done with the basic uh, clock, pin control and regulator, we are uh, at the cusp of uh, enabling the rest of the devices, but then there are small, small infrastructure items uh, which, are most of, which are mostly upstream and we just need to 
probably add a compatible or describe the device tree or add some driver data inside the particular driver so we'll go about these items next before we switch gears so in the soc infrastructure first is the pmu uh, in pmu uh, we don't need to touch the driver we just need to add the compatible drivers upstream it is arm v8 pmu v3 uh, next is the pesky in uh, Pe pesky we use the compatible arm pesky 1.2 no nothing no fancy things here then we have smem in case of smem we use the compatible qualcomm smem and describe the load in the device tree uh, next is the mutex so in this case we describe the qualcomm tcsr mutex in as a compatible and uh, 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 describe the device tree node and we are done then comes the us sqmp in this case we need to add a platform specific compatible because uh, if you look at the qmp draw uss driver uh, this is present in driver SOC qualcomm Qualcomm USS.C. Uh, there is a platform specific uh, offset and data which is required to be added for each specific platform. So we go ahead and go and add a new compatible for this case, uh, something like SM8150 we added and uh, describe the offsets in the driver and, and then the device tree node and we are done with that. Uh, then we have a mailbox. Uh, we uh, add platform compatible again and the data like we did in the case of AOSS in the previous uh, case. So in this case, the mailbox driver is drivers mailbox Qualcomm APCS IPC mailbox C. And uh, last is the apps RSC, in which case RSC stands for resource chat coordinator. We just need to uh, add the compatible and the device tree node. So these are the small small SOC infrastructure items which are required for uh, required by various devices and drivers. So we just uh, get these out of our way before we start uh, the bigger items. So which in this case is UFS. So UFS has uh, two parts to it. One is the controller UFS part and one is the file part. In case of controller, uh, UFS controller uh, is upstream. We don't need to do any code changes in it. We can use the compatible Qualcomm UFS uh, AI host controller uh, and we describe the TA device tree. If you look at the downstream uh, UFS description, the UFS also contains ICE, which is in integrated crypto engine. Uh, that is not yet upstream, and uh, people have been posting the patches on it. So hopefully, it should land up upstream pretty soon. Uh, next comes the UFS5. Uh, uh, typically, we need uh, to do some driver changes in order to support the required files. Uh, files are mostly platform specific, or even in this case, if the files are reused, probably we need a new initialization sequence or new calibration sequence for that particular file. Uh, one of the good things with respect to file in Qualcomm chipsets is, excuse me. They use a common uh, file which is called QMP5. Uh, it is used across various subsystems like UFS, USB, and PCIEs. So, uh, QMP5 driver is already upstream. And uh, what we would need to do for a specific platform is to kind of describe the sequences of its initialization as well as calibration. Uh, that uh, obviously differs from the platform to platform uh, so in this case what we do is we take the downstream uh, file driver uh, which it actually is not the qmp file driver they use a different uh, file platform specific file driver so we take that particular platform specific file driver uh, uh, collate the sequences for initialization and calibration and then uh, uh, try to code them in the initialization and uh, calibration uh, sequences in the QMP driver. And uh, typically, it does involve a bit of trial and error uh, to get it working. So once you are done, your file should be up. Uh, by the way, it's, uh, even for the same platform, UFS, PCI, USB, so forth will require a different sequences. Uh, they don't uh, work. Uh, uh, if you know a little bit more about the file, you will know why. Uh, the UFS file initialization sequence will be a bit different from PCIe uh, 
which will be a bit different from the USB. So each one is a specific um, sequence to the type of implementation it is targeting. Uh, so with this, if you have file driver up and running, and then you should be able to see when you boot up uh, various uh, uh, UFS partitions uh, enumerated on your D message log. So that would tell us uh, that the file is uh, UFS is up. Uh, what typically I would do is to start running DD on that particular uh, file on the particular UFS partitions and to see how much what is the performance to tell me that if my uh, uh, configuration is right or not. Uh, uh, so if you get a decent bandwidth out of the file, then it should be fine. And the last we are discussing is the UF, uh, USB. Uh, in this case, again, the control is upstream, so no changes required to be done. Uh, we use compatible Qualcomm DWC3 in this case. Uh, one of the distinct uh, features, I would say, of this particular device tree node is that you also need to describe a child node, which points to the core uh, DWC3 IP block. This is how the uh, DWC has been designed upstream. Uh, so for this, we add the compatible for Synopsys DWC3. Uh, this controller supports both uh, super speed and uh, high speed file, high speed uh, USB. Uh, again, just like in the case of UFS, we need to add support for uh, uh, file for USB as well. So uh, if the we need to check what file is being used for the uh, for the platform and uh, again downstream device tree will tell you the description uh, so typically uh, if it's using qmp5 for both super speed and high speed then you already have a driver for it and as discussed in the ufs case we just go ahead and add the sequences for usb uh, if in this case like few places we have seen uh, that the usb is not using uh, qmp5 they are using a uh, different file for example sm815 zero platform uses uh, synopsis 5 for high speed usb and for super speed it actually uses qmp5 so you, we, we can go about to go ahead and start adding the synopsis 5 driver and uh, upstream that that would be uh, required to be done so with this uh, we have kind of come to the end of the various uh, component descriptions so let's see where we are on the uh, today's upstream status of the sm8150 platform so global call controller is upstream pin controller is upstream regulators are upstream device street all the description is upstream uh, remote proc clock controller is upstream all the remote procs uh, like adsp cdsp are upstream ufs is upstream usb the file is upstream device tree i think is already probably picked up in this uh, cycle so with this all the whole base soc infrastructure is upstream and uh, uh, we can kind of potentially look at uh, bigger uh, ticket items like media and uh, uh, modem and so forth uh, so there are some additional resources for people to use in case of uh, knowing the more details about Qualcomm uh, uh, upstream support uh, our team uh, typically has a uh, buff at Lenaro Connect, we call it Qualcomm Upstreaming Buff. Uh, here we kind of go through in depth, uh, in more details about what is the upstream state of each platform and uh, where, uh, where, what are the lingering items, what uh, other folks are doing. So that gives you a good view if you want to look at the past connects. Uh, these sessions should be recorded on. Uh, uh, internet and you can find out what was the Qualcomm uh, upstreaming status at uh, previous connect and so forth. So uh, from the code point of view, our uh, Lenaro Qualcomm landing team has a uh, integration tree which is rebased all uh, every time on uh, the latest kernel. So right now it would be based out of 4.rcx. Uh, 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 so if you look at the, this integration tree, it will uh, uh, feature uh, all the latest uh, patches which are being developed by folks in my team and going upstream so you can look at the 
uh, recent work in progress code as well. Uh, then there is 96 boards. Uh, we have uh, uh, Snapdragon, uh, Snapdragon HDM 845 based RB3 platform, uh, which is kind of more our bread and butter these days for a development vehicle. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, there was a recently announced RB5 platform, which uh, features uh, SM8250 chipset. A lot of patches for 8250 chipset are already upstream. Uh, as well so you can look at that board as well for your development needs so with this uh, we come to the end of this presentation uh, hopefully it uh, helped you to understand uh, various aspects of Qualcomm SOC how things are uh, uh, built uh, built on Qualcomm SOC how you can go about trying to upstream uh, if that is the case you are interested in uh, with this, let's uh, go to the Q&A. Uh, hey guys, uh, now for the questions, uh, feel free to keep uh, sending them in. We have got, got almost like five, 10 minutes to sort out the questions. Uh, the first question is from Alex about 32764. Uh, that's typically sleep clock. Uh, you can see uh, this is the 32 kilohertz sleep clock, which typically the oscillators will provide as an input, and uh, uh, people <coughs> use that clock. Uh, I don't see anything unusual in that. Can you follow up uh, the unusual part of the this for me. Uh, next question is from Daniel Gomez. Uh, do you have any sort of dock data sheets beside the downstream driver for doing the all upstream work? So as part of uh, Qualcomm landing team, we do have access to some of the specs from Qualcomm and some data sheets, but not all of them. So sometimes we do get adva take advantage of that and are able to f figure out answers. Uh, but in a bunch of cases, we do not get a lot of information. So yeah, but we have access to a lot of Qualcomm engineers who actually help us on uh, understanding or answering our questions. Uh, then the third talk question is from Ken. Uh, Qualcomm SOC is a heterogeneous with many cores such as RPM and EOSS. Uh, which run non-open source binary software. Changes in these need to align to the version of kernel open source code. How is to best manage the versioning and code control? So for uh, all the non-open source binaries, we do not do any changes to them. Uh, we use whatever Qualcomm provides us as part of the release for a specific board, and we do not have access to uh, the non-open source binaries and uh, we just use as they come, and uh, uh, we don't do any versioning or code control of those particular binaries at all. So I won't be able to answer on how to do versioning on that part at all. Uh, next is from Sudeep. How much did it took total to upstream all of that? So for this SM8150, I roughly would have taken three months approximately to do the whole BSP upstreaming that is along with uh, my maintainership duties and other things which keep on coming so if somebody is focused and knows what they are doing and has experience doing this kind of stuff uh, I, for me it was actually a first arm platform i'm working on so it should not take more than two to three months of dedicated time to upstream uh, the complete base port uh, then from following question from John is from SOC to SOC, how much code upstream is reused? So as you can see uh, in a lot of uh, talks, a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, so topics, as I mentioned, uh, it actually may, is adding a compatible because the base driver is already upstream. So from that point of view, it doesn't take a lot of changes in code. It's just adding compatible and adding the data. Uh, but then things like uh, clock driver and everything, they uh, or regulators, they are uh, you have to kind of write the clock driver from scratch, describe the regulators for the board from scratch. But 
from the rest of the BSP infrastructure items, if you look at it from the table which you had seen on the upstream state, almost I would say 70 to 80 percent is actually reused from one SOC to other SOCs. Uh, next, is there any upstream support for this question is from Sanjeev? Is there any upstream support for IPQ 40X9? Um, uh, I am not sure about the IPQ line. I have not followed on that. Probably you can uh, ping us on the IRC on the narrow channel or on the mailing list. Uh, I have seen some IPQ versions, but I'm not sure which of the IPQ version is that. Uh, any more questions, guys? Going once, going twice. Uh, thank you, folks, for uh, joining in. Hopefully, it was a good learning experience. Unfortunately, I'm having some video issues, so you are not able to see me, and I had to log back on the phone line to uh, give answers to you guys. Uh, feel free to ping me on the Slack channel where we can continue the discussions uh, on this topic or any other topics you may have interest in. Thank you very much.